My name is Ruth Crane. I was born on the 22nd of 11th, 11th month, 1927. At home, we spoke, we conversed in Polish, in school, Polish, at school in Polish. Uh, in this particular town, uh, you heard a lot of German, and it was Schlesisch as well, a mixture of German and uh, Polish. At home, uh, my parents conversed in Hebrew, in Yiddish, in German, in Polish, and French. And when I played with the children where I lived, in the flat, in the apartments where we lived, it was fine. But once I started school, um, if I went by myself, it wasn't very pleasant. It was very, we were taunted and ridiculed. If we went in a group, it was easier. So one day I, I asked my mother, I said, why? Why, what have I done wrong? Why is this happening? So my mother said, you didn't do anything wrong, darling. We are Jewish, and so it's up to you. Or are you going to accept this, because I know you love your Jewishness, or are you going to resent it? So somehow, I think something changed within me. I was too young to analyze it, but I realized that I can change anyone else, that I've got to change my approach without even thinking about it much. So I think I walked prouder. Maybe I'd made it, and I was all of uh, six years, or not even six then. But that's how it was for Jewish children in Poland. You had to grow up very fast. At the outbreak of the war, we had to leave this town just a couple of days later, so like around the 3rd of September. And I asked my mother, what will happen to my friends? And my mother said the same, what will happen to all of to us, to all of us. She meant all of Jews, all of the Jewish population in, in Cimianowice. And I said, no, I mean my books. What will happen with my books? As there were hundreds of them. As one room, we had one room that was lined only with books. A little table there, not so little, and uh, two chairs. And once uh, I went in there, nobody disturbed me. I could stay for as long as I wanted. Nobody called me even for a meal, <laughs> if a meal was ready. So uh, she said, just one book. We stayed for about two years and nine months in Olkush, later on in the ghetto. And we lived in a little flat, always with two or three families. We had a little kitchenette, and we con considered this a blessing. And as long as I was with my family, I had there was structure and continuity somehow. Uh, we, we had to walk sideways, because there were four of us, and uh, there was a little makeshift table and a little uh, uh, stove and a little cupboard, and we considered ourselves fortunate that we had this. And every Friday night, my mother lit the candles on this makeshift table, and we gathered around, and we watched those flickering little lights with wonder and astonishment, really. And outside, the war was raging, and, and nothing mattered. Nothing mattered but this, this Shabbat, this, those moments. One day I was coming, it was a lovely day, and I was coming from Salavai Selfish, and I was really walking very uh, energetically because I wanted to share the lesson with my mother, so apparently maybe as I had to wear a white band with the Star of David, to be visible at all times. So apparently somehow it was not, it turned inwards. And I saw some German guards, I thought approaching, but I thought they're going to pass me by, and, but they didn't. So they stopped and they asked, wo is deine Schandebande? Where is your band of shame? 
And I answered, this is meine Ehrebande, without hesitation. And so they dragged me to their quarters. And I thought, I don't care if they will kill me. I don't care. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say that I'm ashamed. I am, to me, that's, that's what it, the interpretation of it was. That's what it was, would have been. If it would have been a few months later, they would have shot me on the spot. We all went to Benjin, and we were together with my grandparents and with auntie and uncle and another cousin. We stayed together then. That was still before the ghetto. And um, I didn't want my mother to work. And she was asked to go to work. She was in her early 30s. So I went. So this was finishing German uniforms. That was about three months that I worked there. and. Um, each morning when I went to that factory, I felt so, it wasn't far from where we lived, but I felt it was so gray and it was so dull and it was so unpleasant. And each time I felt so, this sort of, you know, this dislike washing over me. Not really fear, but just a deep dislike that I've got to stand there and do it. But then I thought, each day I thought the same thing, but it will go fast, and in the evening I will be at home, and I will be together with my parents, and I will be with my little sister, and I will have my book. We were there for about a couple of days, and uh, we were picked at random to go to various camps. Of course, we didn't know then what's going to happen. I think if I would have been a bit longer, perhaps, you know, I would have been released from there somehow. My father would have seen to it. But uh, it happened really very fast. The first three were forced labor camps. The last one was a concentration camp. I was there about 16 months, and had something happened there which was devastating at that time. There was an incident in January 1944. One morning, there were about um, always over a thousand girls in this camp and we were working in an ammunition factory. We marched when it was dark, and we came back when it was dark. And between, in between, there were all calls that we stood there. It was, if it was winter, if it was snowing, or if it was summer, it made no difference, sometimes for a long, long time. And this particular morning, we were told to line up against the walls and we lived, we were, if you can call it living, we were in an old dilapidated castle. And that was, there was an old, very old ball, a huge ballroom there. And we were told to, to line up undressed. And each of us uh, has to, had to step into the middle of this circle. And the circle consisted of uh, uh, physicians, uh, officers, the, the, the distinguished German officers, and other, other people like lawyers and, and, you know. And so we had to sort of turn around and around and around. And then uh, a number was put around my neck on a piece of string engraved on all pieces of metal sort of like a reddish piece of metal, and the number was 26748. And this is how I went into the Stube, which was a room. In every room, it wasn't a small room, but there were 150 girls in each room. And I felt that this is really the end. I felt there is nowhere lower to go, because this, this is supposed to st strip us of our last shred of dignity. 
But in the evening, when I crept up to my to that little makeshift bed, I was surprised that I could pray. I didn't think that I would be able to pray ever again, because now I was a number. I was reduced to a number, and yet I could pray. She leaned over and whispered, sing to me a French song, Rutka. Sing to me a song in French. I said, how can I? How can I sing now? How can you ask this? She said, yes, you can and you must. And I, I, think that I thought that after a while that she really helped me. On the 8th of May, we woke up and as I said, there was this incredible stillness. It was just this deadly silence. And then uh, we had banging on the door, loud banging and voices from uh, the young men that were in Reichenbach and Langenbilla. And they just poured in. And to our amazement and astonishment, really, I mean, we just couldn't believe in the way we looked, all of us, but we didn't care. We didn't care. We just ran down the hill into where the, where the Russian tanks, where the Russian in their tanks were coming in. I always nurtured a bit of hope. It sort of, it was, I felt it was like, like a little flame, you know, and that little flame burst, burst into a little, that little light, really, burst into a little flame. And I thought, I've got to go and look if anyone has survived because of this is what we were hoping and praying for uh, any member of our family surviving. I went to Shemianovice and uh, it was very frightening really and this uh, my neighbor who professed to love us so much she was living in our flat and uh, Yet I'm grateful, very grateful to her because she gave me the photo of my two little sisters. I didn't really know uh, what to do. I mean, those skills that children learn while they're attending schools, when they are free, of course we didn't have those skills. And I realized that I had to, I have to know, I knew who I was. But I had to sort out my feelings and emotions, or the lack of them. And I felt, because I felt sometimes totally numb, and sometimes I felt anger and sadness and hate. Yes, and I hated the whole thing. But then I thought, no, after a while, I thought, no, this is not who I am. This is not what my parents would wanted me to be someone that is filled with hate, and hate and love doesn't mix. And I think they would have wanted me to, to love people and to accept the love of other people. We came to Australia, what we thought only for a little while. We fell in love with Australia too. The people were so kind. And for the first time, I went down the street after a couple of weeks, and I started to glance to my left and to my right, and I realized I don't need it. I don't need to look anymore. I'm free. For the first time, I felt that I'm free, really. And I was 21 years of age, and I felt for the first time that I'm free. When they come and they speak to survivor, it's very somehow for them. It's very powerful, sort of, because this, he, they were really there. And this is what I tell them now that as long as we are here, if there will be denials later on, and there are even now, then we can now speak, we can say, we were there, I was there, where is my family? But later on, you will be the ones, even if each, with every group, even if one of you will remember and answer this, then it will be worthwhile. And not to forget the six million, or particularly the million and a half of Jewish children, never ever to forget them. Young people like, like myself, we were nurtured. We had a lot of spiritual guidance. 
and this created a need for inspiration. We are still subconsciously looking for something to inspire us. And this, I think, this allows us sometimes to rise above certain happenings. So when I have the photos and I have certain letters, so this enriches and inspires. So in a way it saves my life every day.